This, I think, is the first greenhouse, greenhouse that is actually in the U.S. Does anyone know where this is? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, um, Monticello. Yeah. So, um, yeah, great. Uh, there's a glass house. Underneath the floor, they had these big, long brick flues that the, the heat came through. And they kept things like uh, lemons and, uh, and uh, oranges and stuff in there. Now this is actually, we've come a long way since then. Now we have polycarbonate, now we have aluminum extrusions, now we have steel. Um, and this is actually the Stone Barn Center greenhouse. And it's, a, it's a beautiful setup in there and um, do a lot of, of production of greens year round in there. So there's a lot of advances that have happened even in the last 20 years in our industry that have really made winter growing a doable and very, very profitable. All right, so let's dive right in here. This is kind of the overview of a two-day um, conference we give on winter growing. So um, last one we did was last spring. Paul and Sandy Arnold and I did a, a full two days on winter growing, which was a fabulous event. Um, but this is kind of the condensed version, so it's going to go fast, and we're just going to skim the top. Again, keep your questions till the end, and we will we'll get to them. So again, the biggest thing about your winter growing is soil is if you have poor soil, winter growing is very hard on the plants. It's a very hard environment. And so for us in our greenhouses and our fields that are going to have that winter growing, we are usually doing a soil test twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall. And we're also doing things like a saturated media test or a greenhouse soil test. And those are some more of advanced tests that they're starting to do in, I think Vermont does them, and I think Massachusetts does them as well, um, the state departments there. because. Because when we start putting so much organic matter, and some of our greenhouses were running 12 to 15 percent organic matter, it really starts to screw with the the nutrient levels because those t the, the tests are normally geared toward um, soil tests organic matter levels of two to five percent. So that's why we're starting to go with some of these more advanced tests. And um, what we try to think about is that your winter growing soil is more like a highly tuned race car. And obviously with that, you're putting a lot more expensive amendments. So we're not just throwing you know, some compost in there. We're usually putting some a little bit more. We're really worried about the micronutrients. And the, one of the things that came out in the last year, and there's some work being done by a couple different land-grant universities, is how important silica is to A, disease resistance, but also just the cell structure of, of growing of greens especially, especially in the winter time. So they're actually now, they have silica that you can buy as a micronutrient and you can spray that on or put that on the soils. But again, a lot of what we're doing in the greenhouse comes from compost. And we're really focusing on using a plant-based compost. So usually coming from leaf uh, litter, um, we went to our town and we would just buy in. We had a contract with them for all the leaves that they were producing. And then we were turning that two or three years later, going into the greenhouse, so a really nice finished compost in there. Um, the reason you don't want the animal-based compost is they have a lot of high salt levels. And eventually your greenhouse soil will get such high salt levels that it won't allow crops to germinate. So that's why we're doing that. If you do feel like you have high salt levels, if after your greenhouse soil dries out, it feels like a white crust is on the top, um, you can A, some people are skimming that off, or just taking the plastic off and just really trying to flush it out with a lot of water. A big question we always get is east, west, or north, south? And it obviously comes back to will the grade allow? What will the grade allow? What will your slope allow? Um, and so, you know, above the, the, up here, above this right here, you're going to be going east, west is the best. Down in here, you're really going to, it doesn't matter, either nor east, west, or north, south, it really doesn't matter. The sun is high enough in the sky that will still give you a good, a good year-round, um, uh, good, good, good um, light penetration. Um, so here, another thing to think about is your snowfall. I see so many farmers who go out and get an NRCS grant to build a greenhouse, and it's, they're not, depends on the state, they're sometimes not for a lot of amount of money. So they go shopping for a greenhouse, and they go shop for a greenhouse that's cheap enough for that, and they end up buying a greenhouse that's not rated for their snowfall. And because they're not experienced growers, they end up with a collapsed greenhouse. And we'll talk about what you can do to prevent that, but I think the big thing I'm going to say is look at this chart, and if you're going to buy a greenhouse, make sure that it's properly rated for your area. 
All right, tunnel location here. Make sure you're not under trees. Make sure you're, it's not shaded. You're not under power poles. We had a grower in New York who had to move his high tunnel because it was under a power right away. That's no fun, especially when you're spending all the money to grade it, build it, put crop in it. Um, watch the north side of the mountains. Um, protect from high wind, too. So we do like to put it, um, wind breaks around our tunnels. Just make sure they're far enough away that the wind break could never hit the tunnel. And then high and dry. I've seen many people put them on a floodplain, and then they have flooded their greenhouse, which is no fun either. Um, and also know that there's a difference between summer and winter shade. So this north side of the mountain, we had it in, you know, in the summertime. That field got sun all day long. It was great. Once it got to November, the sun went down far enough that we never got the proper amount of light. And we only had a couple hours of daylight, actually, that hit that tunnel during the day. Drainage. So a 30 by 100 foot tunnel gives a lot of water off. And so 1,800 gallons, in fact, with a one inch rain. So where's that going to go? So we really like to make sure you're putting down the proper drainage around it. Um, crushed stone, usually buried in a tile drain around that. And in our long form talk, we actually go into quite detail on that. And you can also throw that in a cistern. You can push that to a pond or something like that. So it really depends on how big of many tunnels you have and how valuable that water is to you. So a couple different styles and shapes of tunnels. We're going to try to cover this real briefly. For winter production, you can use the mini tunnels uh, or, or low tunnels. People call them low tunnels. Um, here is a hoop house. So this is more of like a caterpillar style tunnel. We had our transplant house, which is where we did all our microgreen production. So we did heated benches with microgreens. And then obviously we had a great number of high tunnels. So this is the, the mini tunnels here, putting those out. Normally we were just using them for overwintering crops. So we would seed in the fall, they would get up a little bit, we'd overwinter them, we'd get them a couple weeks earlier in the spring. You can also use it to protect um, like late growing kale and chard and stuff like that. So here you can see there's also do overwinter onions in them. And so you would put down, so we'd plant the onions in let's say October, they would start to root a little bit, put some covers on, cover them up, and plastic, and there they are. The big thing, the challenges with this, there's a lot of challenges with these. One is accessing them in the winter. If you're putting like fall planted crops and you're trying to access them in the winter. So you can see here, he is shoveling this out. But up where we are, this is only a, a light snow. So we would get where you just, all you could see was snow and just little hoops. And so what we would do is you would, if you had to go harvest in there, because, because that snow protects the crop so much that it actually is usually above freezing in there and you could harvest in there during the wintertime, you would actually just like open the end up, stick someone in the end, tie a rope to their foot, and they would kind of crawl down <laughs> the tunnel. And anytime they had a bin full, you'd just kind of like pull the rope and you'd pull them back out. So it's, it's not a great system. Um, the other thing you're facing, too, is that these plastics, so you put your, your row cover bags on that, and then the snow gets on there, and then it warms up a little bit, so it freezes, and then you get ice blocks all the way along there. And then what happens is it thaws a little bit and it gets windy. Now, because that's ice, it's super, super slick. And so this plastic just works its way out and just flies away. So the advantage here with the three next to each other, you get a big piece of plastic, and it goes from this to this to this. So this middle one you can only access from the end. The two side ones you can access from the sides. But because that plastic goes over and back under, that keeps all the way along there really nice, keeps it really down. Again, do not recommend these. They are cheap, about 50 cents a square foot or less um, to put together. Um, JM does them where he does it over two beds. And he actually had someone take 10 foot half inch conduit and weld it to its 14 foot. So it went over the entire way. The problem is, Half inch conduit was a, at 30 inch wide, covering like a 40 inch bed was okay. But when you try to cover two beds, um, it didn't make sense. You had a lot of them collapsing and all sorts of lovely stuff. A um, couple crops you can put in. We would actually try to keep kale and Swiss chard going in those. Um, we put late greens in those, overwintered onions or overwintered greens as well. We ended up moving to the kale and Swiss chard. We would just go ahead and clear cut the beds in October or November and then just stick that in crates for six or eight weeks. And because the greens are going into the fall, and because they're getting colder and they're starting to acclimate and harden off, they're starting to put a lot more sugars into their leaves, and they're slowing down the respiration. And so that means that if you cut it at that point, you can throw them in the, in the cooler and crates at 34 degrees or 33 degrees, 100% humidity, and that will last till January or February. 
So you're just taking the kale out of the crates, bunching it, sending it to the farmer's market. Because it's completely slowed down that respiration, it'll just last for, for a really long time. And then after your customer gets it, it still lasts another 10 days in their fridge. So the next thing you can go with is hoop houses. Now I love hoop houses, they're relatively cheap. The biggest problem with them is you, we're doing a lot of movable hoop houses. So that means you're putting them up, taking them down. And depending on this, the amount of work you're doing, this is an old style we don't really do any longer. We do more of the caterpillar style now, which is, um, I don't know, I think I got, more, yeah, this is more of a caterpillar style here. Um, about five to 10 hours per tunnel, depending on how good your crew is, putting them up. Now, the things I do like about these is they're cheap. If you're just starting out, they're easy to get up. They're great temporary if you want to just push some crops along. If you're trying to start crops in the spring, it give you a four or five week jump on the outside. If you're doing summer crops, we're not talking about those today, but I can still show the slide. Um, you, we, put a, we put them next to each other. So we just have them lined all the way up down the field. And so what we do is during the winter, this is how they'd be set up. They'd have a bow every four feet. During the summer, every other bow would go between and you're just covering the entire space. So that makes sense? Cool. All right, a couple things with end design on these things is um, a lot of people are doing this where they had a, a, a wire or a strap going along here and then down to a stake. Well, this right here is a great liability hazard. So it falls on that. So what we recommend is either driving that stake all the way into the ground and just, um, or using like a screw and auger, or you can see, so you can see this is how it's kind of set up like that or running, so you can see here is we like to take our end bow and kind of can veer it out a bit. And so that takes some of that stress off that stake in the ground and you can use a smaller, um, uh, like a screw and anchor or something and it pushes that stress back onto the base of this. So it the stress of holding all that plastic out is, is tr it's transferred into this one right here. And this is actually, this needs to go to a lot more of an angle for that to actually work well. So you can see here how we did with this one. We did this with, um, we actually ran 30 inch posts down into the ground right here. And we actually ran um, two by fours, made a door in the middle, and then kind of veered this out a little bit at ours. So you can kind of see. And then what we did is we put a, a, a screen door in this one right here. So this is more of a permanent structure. And then we just did, right here, we did scissor doors. So that basically is the plastics attached to that rod right there. And so that just swings across. And you can see, I don't know if I have a picture of it closed up. I don't have a picture of it closed up. But it just allows this to kind of just close that area and easy access and easy venting as well. So um, other things I've done too is kind of view that even out further and go straight down. Because the problem with this style is you lose all the space at the end. So you have about an 8 foot or 10 foot section at the end of your caterpillar tunnel, which is just wasted space. So what we've done is kind of changed it. And so we put it like at a 45 degree angle, and then you can run your crop right to the end here. All right, a couple reasons I don't like those caterpillars. One, it's because of that system, is they're just the waste of space. And the other thing is they are, you can't automate them. With high tunnels, you can automate them. I love automating things on my farm because that allows us to not do the monotonous tasks over and over again and really smoke, focus on the smart work. Um, so, but here is, if you're trying to vent them, you can get water in them. So one of the things, if you're venting and pushing that side up, always wrap the plastic underneath. And that means that you're not getting the plastic, you're not wrapping the plastic this way, which means the water gets behind it and then creates all nasty sorts of gooey mess. Um, so on this one right here, these ones, we were actually would do a trench and bury the plastic. And so this was a long-term winter style tunnel. You can see that with bracing and all that sort of stuff. Um, there we go. So the other thing we did on our tunnels is because those tunnels were so low, if we wanted to go a little bit more long term with them is we raised the ground post. So we did a longer ground post, which means allowed us to run our tillage equipment right up and near the end of the um, tunnel. So we'd have four beds across there. And so we wouldn't have to take the tunnel down the till. All right. Another sort of thing for us is we did a hay grove on winter. And the thing about a hay grove is that their tunnels are very cheap per square foot. And the reason they're very cheap per square foot is because there's very little to them. Um, so again, a lot of maintenance. Um, and you have to take the plastic off because it will not survive snow, at least where we were. Um, and so we got tired of that because it's in the spring again. It would take you know six or eight people a couple hours to put that back on. 
One thing we did like is about the doors is it gives really easy access and you can create those doors as wide as you want because there's just a really a super easy roll up door. And then there's it fully, um, this was probably about December, this would have been taken. And there you go. Again, you're losing those couple months in the wintertime when you really want to be having greens in your tunnel. Unless, if you're like running a nine month CSA and all you're running to is Christmas, one of those could actually really work out really well because that last month you're just, your greens have been cut and put in a cooler and uh, you don't need that space. But again, they're using this multi-bay units for things like fruit. They're also using it for transplants and that sort of thing. You can see here's a, a big range up in Canada. The other thing with those hay groves though is they're not built to handle some of the winds that we get in the U.S. Um, you get a straight line wind, a Derrico, something like that, and it can just crush those. And yeah, not a good picture. All right, high tunnels. I love high tunnels. High tunnels are the most expensive per square foot. You can get anywhere from probably $3 to, I've seen as high as $13 per square foot. Obviously, when you're at that price, you're getting a really, really nice tunnel. You're less worried about snow load if, again, you buy the right tunnel for your area. A lot easier to automate. Um, here is <laughs> a, a grower taking off uh, the cover because there's it's not gonna they know it's not gonna handle the snow load so they're actually going and just slitting all the plastic to try to get that so it doesn't collapse it. Um, so one of the things you really want to make sure is that the angle's right so you're using more of a, a gothic style um, house. The other thing we would do is again push the sidewalls a lot higher and one of the problems with tunnels that like this is your your sidewalls are short and so your your snow builds up and eventually there's no place for it to go unless you're going to get in there and clean all that snow out the side and some people put them too close together or they put them on a hill so they can't get in there and actually take that snow away and then it causes things like this so what you do is you raise the sides up another couple feet it just allows a lot more space for it to build up before it kind of stops and then keeps starting going right toward the peak all right wood in a greenhouse we really do not recommend using wood at all in a greenhouse we've seen multiple situations where they use woods on the hip boards and the wood rotted in the middle of the winter a nice windstorm came away pulled the plastic and they lost everything in the tunnel so it's definitely worth the extra couple thousand dollars to put um, metal hip boards baseboards and all the end supports and then you're never replacing it so you've got a 20 year life cycle product instead of like a three or i mean a five or a ten year um, this is one situation where we did is we actually put in um, four foot high wooden sidewalls because this was actually an animal house so we wanted to be able to put up our bring up our bedding to four feet and this is um, um, hemlock so it's going to last a little bit longer and then we also use a lot of locusts in here so locusts will last wears like iron lasts a very long time so you can see the locust post there all right um, so you can see here that this is a knee wall. I think that's what that, no, that's, all right. Um, the knee wall, so what a knee wall is, is a knee wall is preventing cold air from coming right across the base and going into your tunnel. And so normally, so this is like up at a um, greenhouse that's being used for seedlings. And so they put that relatively high. But in, um, gosh, I thought there's two other slides here to discuss that. But um, in normal greenhouses, we'll put that use at 18 inches to 24 inches. Um, we talked about drainage a bit earlier, and again, if we're trying to drain a house, this is how we we'll normally do it. Put down the rock in here, put four inch drain tile there, and this is just if your greenhouse is on a, a steep slope like this, um, all ours were. Um, and down here you can just shave it off so it drains away. But again, if you have water coming off, a lot of water, it will, what will happen is it will seep back in and it will reduce the amount of nitrogen in your tunnel and uh, really starve the plants. And then just the stuff doesn't grow. Spinach hates wet feet, and one of the major crops in the wintertime for people is normally spinach. So again, putting the gravel right there, backfilling it. Again, this is that knee wall. Distance between tunnels too. So you can see here, um, you want to have enough space so that it can, you can the, the snow will fall away, and then enough space so you can clear snow. So if you've got and the other thing you have to think about for the distance between is so they don't shade each other. So the normal formula is twice the distance, the height. So if you're a 15 foot tall tunnel, you want to be 30 feet between your tunnel so it doesn't shade the other next one. Um, so again, knee walls. And we're also insulating the bases as well. So you can see here how we've put two inch foam board 
all the way around the tunnel. The other thing we're now doing is we're putting flashing from here down about 15 inches um, to keep out the voles and rats. Um, so, or you can take this right here, which is a polycarbonate, and drop that in another foot or so, and that will keep out those, those rats and rodents. Um, again, this was a, for our, this is our super cheap knee wall. Again, this is wood, so you shouldn't do that. You can replace this with a, Harnois sells a, a channel, a really heavy duty single wiggle wire channel you could replace this with, or you could just use a two by two square steel with a regular single wiggle wire channel on that to replace this wood, and then just wiggle wire your fabric in there. So this is like a, a woven poly right there, and that just keeps that, that last 18 inches protected from the wind. Now this was in Florida, this was a client we had in Florida, where they actually, because they're so warm down there, the hill they just used was just ground cloth for that knee wall, and they're just trying to keep out rabbits and stuff. Um, so Harn Wall for their knee wall, they just do a wire with plastic folded over it. Super simple, so it's something you could easily do at your place. Um, and then that, wa that plastic could either be buried, or it could be go to a, a, a channel down at the bottom there. So you can kind of see another picture of it right there, how that works. All right, multi-base structures. So um, if you're doing winter production, you're obviously one of the biggest things you're facing is the lack of light in the winter time. And so the problem with a multi-base structure is because with a normal high tunnel, there's three sides to it, and the sun can come in all those sides. With a multi-base structure, all you, the sun can come in is now to the top because those houses are so much wider. So you actually do get less light penetration with these multi-bays, although your temperature stays warmer because it's just a much bigger house and there's a lot less exterior. Um, uh, the, the ratio of the square foot of growing area to the, to the feet of exterior space is so much lower. So again, with, high, with these multi-bay structures, you can do so much more. I mean, you can put in energy curtains, you can put in all this very technical, very fancy um, uh, equipment. And for winter growing, it normally doesn't pay. It usually want to go, if you're going with like a high tunnel with tomatoes and stuff, that's where you really start to put that in. So this is a multi-bay with lettuce in Quebec. This is down at Stone Barns again, their, their set up. Kind of just see how that's right through there. All right, long wind farms. Again, some of these, these multi-bay structures are over a million dollars an acre. That's a roof cleaner for that. Um, again, trying to get as much light in those as possible. So let's talk a little bit about venting here. Here you want to just make sure, even in the winter time, we're trying to keep the moisture levels as low as possible. Um, frequently we're using roll-up sides. Again, automation as much as possible and um, screening. So a lot of people are now screening their tunnels year-round, and A, it's to keep out aphids and flea beetles and that sort of thing, but it's also to keep out weed seeds that are, you know, that are floating, like dandelions and that sort of thing. And with tomatoes, you really have a challenge if you decide to screen your tunnels because tomatoes want a cooler temperature. With things like cucumbers and that sort of in the summer, they actually like that warmer temperature because what happens is that screen prevents your airflow from coming in and out. A couple different covering options. Um, single layer or double. Now if you're doing year-round production like tomatoes in the summer and winter greens in the winter, you probably do want to go with a double layer. Um, it just gives you that much more insulation. But if you're just focused on winter production and your tomatoes don't go in till late and you're not heating them, a single layer can, can actually give you a little bit more production with the more light it allows. So some people are doing polycarbonate in their houses as well. Uh, we recommend it on the ends. Um, not so much on their long portion of the greenhouse. And some people are starting to move into solar wrap as well. And if you can afford it, I think it's definitely a huge advantage. Your 20 year lifespan and it's hail and windproof, um, but it's a lot more expensive. I think a 30 by 96, it costs like five or six K to put that, put it on. All right, frost free water, we definitely recommend that. You, if you're gonna be doing winter greens, you wanna to to irrigate during the winter time and you don't want to wait for a day that's above freezing to bring a hose out. So we just recommend putting a frost free hydrant inside and then doing overhead irrigation like that. Some people are doing, um, uh, they are doing gutters. Again, trying to capture that water and trying to reuse it. 
So another thing to think about is inside covers. And so a lot of people, there's a lot of different uh, thought on this. And um, some of people, the impression that you should just put the covers on and leave them on. Some people are under the impression that you should take the covers off anytime it's above freezing in there so you get the maximum light penetration so the crop will grow. And all are valid. If you want a no work system, you can just put the covers on and just leave them. But you're going to have more issues with disease. Your plants won't be as quite as hardy and um, you'll probably get more bugs in there. But if you do go ahead and take those covers off religiously anytime that it's above freezing, um, you're going to get a lot more growth because there's a lot more sun can get through there. Those, those covers really decrease the amount of light that can actually get into there. Um, all right, let's talk about snow. So again, that is decreasing your light as well. So we would actually have our guys go out and really try to get away that snow in the, in the winter. And normally we would run along there with a plow first, like a, a snow plow or a snow blower. But then that last little bit, the last 8 or 10 inches, you don't want to damage your plastic. So we'd hand do that. Collapsing. Um, the other thing with snow is a lot of people say, all right, I bought a great house. It's going to take this snow. But what happens, and what happened on this house, this is a friend of mine, is the snow came from this direction across the tunnel. So what happened is all the snow built up on one side of the tunnel. And if you load that tunnel properly on both sides with snow on either side, it's fine. But if it's all on one side, it just collapses in like that one did and just creates a disaster. So if you are in a latitude where you can go either east, west, or north, south, a lot of people face the end of the tunnel into the prevailing wind. So that when that snowstorm comes, it goes the long way of the tunnel and doesn't end up pushing it all onto one side. So yeah, you can see a couple snow load here. Just think about it, how much that equals. And wind damage, too. So wind can also take out a tunnel. And a normal time that a wind will take out a tunnel is right after our tunnel's been put up. And those ground posts are still kind of loose in the soil. And, they, and what the ground has not solidified around it. So we really do recommend putting them pretty big ground anchors. Um, or even like you can put in these duck bills. But you have to put those in a lot more frequently because they don't have as much um, stay power. All right, so let's talk a little bit about planting. And then we're going to try to get into some of the actual cropping. So thing for us, every place in the US is going to be a little bit different with the dates you need to plant. And so the number one thing you can do to fast track yourself for winter growing success is every single year take great records and great pictures every single week of what's going on in your tunnel. And so um, because what happens is then you can say, all right, so this planting was on 9-12 for spinach. And that was a little bit early this year. And so then you can look back, and the next year you can go to 9-15 or 9-18. Or you can say, you know, this year was a little bit warmer than normal, so we had a little bit more growth. But I think the date's about the right. Because the thing with the weather is you can't control it whether you're going to be warm or cold in the fall. So you just kind of have to play it by ear and kind of just kind of see what you feel like is happening. So what we would do is we would start our planning for what crops you're growing uh, based on what came back from our markets or our farmers markets because we were majority doing farmers markets and that's where our crop went so start with what was coming back and the kind of the volume of cropping we needed we would then go into how the, the kind of space we needed to plant that to get that volume and then that would go into our master planning sheet and then we also would do for our tunnels because i really Tunnels can happen so fast, the stuff's growing so fast, is we would actually do a every two weeks of what would be in what bed. And this kind of gave us an idea of what was being planted and when stuff was going to come out. So you can see here, you know, strawberries were actually, and this was an old sheet, but we actually did put strawberries in the tunnel to see if it would work. It does, it just never paid for itself. You just can't get the, the volume off of it to make it work. But you can see here, you've got transplanted turnips and radishes. And then the radishes are actually in this planting were in the center of the bed. And there's a reason for that. So you can see here, this is kind of like the time going on, is we plant, transplant the hackberry turnips and the radishes. The radishes obviously come out earlier. You drop transplants of cucumbers in the center of that bed in the spring. And then those turnips are going to go another two weeks. And because they're on the outside of the bed, those cucumbers don't need that space. And so we're stacking crops, trying to get the maximum amount of production off every single square foot. And then obviously, at the end of the year, the cucumbers come out, the greens go back in. And then after the greens come out, you know, we keep doing a cycle like that. Another thing we do is a lot of interplanting. So this is where we would plant a slow-growing crop between a fast-growing crop. In the fall, the fast-growing crop would be harvested, like the bok choy. 
and then those slow growing Swiss chard would kind of just hunker down over the winter and when March hit that would the light would come back up and the temperature would come back up and those crops would really really take off but if you just put that Swiss chard in there you would have lost that whole greens crop that we were getting in the fall that area um, so again here we would also underplant as well so it's kind of like we would do that, that first I showed you with the radishes and the uh, turnips. But here's where we're in the spring, we're planting our tomatoes in the row. And then on either side of that, we're planting a quick crop of, let's say, beets or lettuce or greens or uh, radishes or something like that. So you can see here that's planting. A little bit later in the season, you can see that lettuce down there. And then as those tomatoes get bigger, they start to want more space and those greens come out. And then we go through and put down our ground cloth on the whole floor of the greenhouse. So another thing we've done a, a few times is we've played around some overplanting. So this is where we'd actually put um, onion sets in the ground in the fall in the greenhouse. So just drop those right down in. And then we'd actually go ahead and seed over it like a greens. And um, this is actually um, in the spring when we tried to do that. In the, 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 the onions came up a little too quick, but we were still able to go through there and take off a complete harvest of um, arugula. It was a little bit more challenging the harvest, but it was able to get us a double yield off that, that section. All right, so another thing to think about here too is as you're planting is your growth rates. And so you can see here, obviously this is your outside. You know, it gets a lot, it goes a lot faster in the summer and then it starts to slow back down again. But in the winter time, you have a couple of six week section or so, you know, December and January where things just are really not growing because of there's not enough light, there's not enough temperature. And so we would plan for that. So that's when we were stockpiling. So we were stockpiling a lot of those greens for that time and just trying to plan to have six weeks worth of production to harvest at that time during the winter time. The number one thing that people, the number one mistake people make in winter growing is not acclimating greens to the cold. So um, you can see here, this is some lettuce, looks great. Um, this is some, you know, bok choy, looks great. And so this is kind of what happens, is you've got your temperatures going along in the fall, it's nice and warm, and all of a sudden your temperature drops. Well, if your, what happens there is then that, that plant will just die. And you can kind of see here, that just, it will just kill it right off. Um, it just damages it because it's not ready for that cold. You see this how that's burned right back. Um, this is arugula, baby arugula. This is uh, other like mustard greens. Um, so let's go back to that diagram and I'll show you how to prevent that. So what you've got to do in the fall is you've got to slowly bring those temperatures down. So if you know that you've got it nice and warm and all of a sudden it's going to drop 20 degrees, you actually need to start heating and you're heating to make sure that it's only going to drop it gently. So maybe a three or four degrees a night, so just slowly harden that off. But normally what happens is, that's going to happen sometimes, but normally what happens in this situation is people are not venting. And so greens in the fall, they plant too late, and greens in the fall are just growing way too fast, and they're way too um, fleshy, and they're just, um, they're not a slow growing green in the fall. So what we try to do is, we'll keep the sides open. Or in this picture in a hoop house, this is kale that's going into the fall. We'll keep the cover off until it starts to really start to get cold and we start to see snow coming. So we're just trying to keep those plants in the fall slow growing and so that more of the, um, it'll harden off and get more sugars in the you know, cell walls. All right, let's talk about some crops because we have how much time left? Oh, so I have all the time I want. <laughs> Okay, 15 minutes before questions. So we'll get through at least a few crops here. Um, number one favorite green uh, is chickweed, obviously. It grows very well in our greenhouses. But as we discussed earlier in the session before, if you're here, steaming is the best way to take care of that. Um, and there's a talk on, on, on uh, YouTube. If you type in, if you look at our channel, you can go and find a, a talk on steaming, which talks you how to take care of that. But look at that lovely chickweed between that spinach. So we've actually, th since the slide deck was put together, we actually moved a lot of our spinach to actually growing it on ground cloth because that really prevents that chickweed from coming in. But um, yeah, a lot of different um, spacings on things. This is radishes. So radishes for me are not a great deep winter crop, but they're good for seeding like either early and going for maybe a Christmas harvest or seeding after January 15th 
and really just seeding them close together. Um, you can actually transplant these radishes too, and they're just, people love them, and so we find that in the wintertime, if we have a little just nice red pile of radishes on our table, it just sucks people from across the room. Favorite variety is Rover. It's awesome. Um, again, that just looks great in January or February when there's not much other things going on. So again, really high yielding too, especially in that winter time. You can really crush it together. You can it really makes um, high dollar per acre. Spinach though is probably the quintessential winter green. It's bulletproof. You can't kill it pretty much. Um, it just really grows well, and there's a, a quite high yield. And customers really love it because it's so sweet in the winter time. So a lot of ways we'll grow that. So we'll throw in a hoop house to start the fall. And then what we'll do here is we'll just plant edge to edge. As we'll just plant the row every 14 inches, weed it once, throw down some soybean meal, and then, um, then harvest, usually December. And uh, then really like space. And um, donkey's good, but I'm, I think they may have dropped that lately. So we're using more renegade. Um, and the thing with the spinach varieties is California usually runs the show. And because they're constantly trying to beat the disease pressure they have out there. So they're moving through the varieties really, really quickly. So us on the East Coast or our small growers have a hard time of actually picking one we like because they're constantly changing. So space has kind of like been a mainstay. It stays around. It just works. Um, there are some other ones which we're playing with. And we've actually, again, in our longer form, we have a whole session on spinach varieties because there's like 25 or 30 we've trialed. But again, space, you can't go wrong with space. And uh, yeah, just really great. Again, really high yield per acre. And really, if you're making, doing a retail price of like six or eight dollars a pound, it can really bring in the, bring the cash. So again, with these hoop houses, you don't get a good, um, in the wintertime, it just stops growing. Because as I showed you, that growth curve. So we're, what we'll do is we'll harvest the whole house out, kind of clean up the plants. You can see how we've taken off like extra nasty leaves and stuck them in the path. And we'll go along and clean that up. And then we'll go ahead and just row cover it and wait till you usually get February or March when the growth starts to regrow. And we'll usually get another two cuts in the spring before the house starts to bolt and we'll rip it out and plant spring greens. But we'll also do some in the greenhouse. And so this is where we'll either just seed right across the bed or we're going to bring in some transplants. If we're doing like late tomatoes, then obviously we're going to try to bring in transplants to give us another couple weeks for those tomatoes. And then we'll also do some beds of ba seeded baby spinach. Now, um, our customers really we had a, a great customer base that really didn't care about the size of the leaf. So for us, we got a lot more yield off the large leaf spinach because we were picking that, usually we're just hand picking the larger leaves, and that meant we were leaving a center rosette of leaves to get growing, or get basically photosynthesis happening and keep growing. And also, if you completely cut off a plant, it all of a sudden goes in the shock mode, and it's like, oh my gosh, I lost all my leaves. So it has to, you know, it prunes the roots and it starts to regrow. But if you leave a center rosette of leaves growing, it's, it still has time and still has space to get, you know, the photosynthesis happening and still keeps growing. All right, 10 minutes until questions? Yeah. All right, we'll keep going. Again, packing it right in there. Really do love the red veined um, spinach. We, we branded it Christmas spinach at our markets. And anyway, it just sold better that way. It does bolt faster. All right, so again, we talked a little bit about the different varieties. And the thing about the different varieties is they're constantly changing. Um, but what we found is that there's all different characteristics, too. Is sometimes people want more spinach. Sometimes people want sweeter spinach. Sometimes people are really focused on disease prevention, so they're going to go with different varieties on that. All right, mescaline, again, for us, our customers weren't great, on, weren't, you know, keen on this one. They really like their lettuce and their spinach. So we would do limited sections of this. Um, and again, you watch your growth curves as well because you can do your stockpiling for your winter. But as March comes around, it starts to get warmer, the soil starts to warm up, the light comes in, and your growth just exponentially takes off. So what we would do is as we started moving to March, we'd start to pull beds out of mescaline production or out of production and start to put in things like tomatoes or you know, spring bunch crops or even carrots and stuff like that. And so you can see here the size of our planting. So in the fall, you know, it's kind of coming down. This was our last big planting. And then we'd stockpile, and then we'd start replanting in January as we were starting to pull out some of these older beds. Again, finding four to five inches between rows, great. 
And here, and this is key right here, you can easily use a time weeder to go over this or even a wire, wire weeder. So our top favorite one was Tokyo Bacana. Really love that. It's heavy. It yields well. People have a hard time distinguishing it from lettuce, so it looks really good in the mix. Um, we also really like the bok choys. The bok choys didn't yield as high, but they were so heavy, so they gave you a lot of weight. And so the thing what we would do after the um, mescaline happened is you know, if we had any extra and got too big, you just cut it in a bunch of braising greens or saute mix or something like that. So also I'd throw in a few extra things like cress, love that. I love mosh. It never makes any money. Um, but we just would grow it because we loved it. And so we always have a corner of it. Or we even in Ohio now, we just grow it outside in the field and just with one layer of row cover and it does fine all winter. Um, but arugula, again, again, a great winter crop. Seeded just like mescaline. Now with kale, we would actually, um, we tried to have kale year round for our client base just really liked it. And so we would start with doing a fall, large fall planting. And as we discussed, we'd go through and clear cut it, put it in bins like that, put the lids on, and then um, put it in the cooler. And we would be able to sell that till Christmas. And then we allowed it to start taking our, after that, um, we'd start selling our stuff from our hoop houses in, in January and February. So again, we also did some baby kale. So just multiple rows of uh, the Red Russian or the, the baits, baits. And then you can see how we've interplanted the kale and the Swiss chard here. So again, um, this would just be what we would start to harvest in January and February. And our favorite was Siberian. Siberian just is a yields great, really winter hardy. Swiss chard, so we would also try to have Swiss chard year round as well. And again, doing the same thing with that, harvesting it from the field, maybe put it in some low tunnels there till Christmas and then interplanting it with either the kale or the Asian greens. And you can see here how that, that looks in the spring as it starts to come on in February. So you can see here a picture of, the, actually, this is the bok choy and kale and chard interplanted. You can see they're going along and harvesting the bok choy, throwing the good leaves into there. They'll drop the bad leaves into the path. And then we'll just go along and take a rake and rake one time down the path and then take all that and dump that on the compost. Again, we're trying to keep our houses as clean and neat as possible to keep disease and insects and um, rodents out. So let us mix. Um, again, our, this is our number one seller for us in the wintertime. So we really devoted a lot of greenhouse space for this and a lot of thought to try to make sure that we were able to produce it as well as possible. So um, we would transplant into our houses in the fall. So pull the tomatoes out, that would go in, and then it would grow up. Now, this was before, this is the picture before we started doing a lot with Salanovas. So at that point, we were just doing a mix of different head lettuces that we would multi-plant and just cut off, you know, for a, a leaf size. Um, so we're doing things like Concept and Panisse and um, Garrison and that sort of stuff. Now we would also, for our deep winter, so till Christmas is we would try to go with the multi-plant, even the salanovas till Christmas. And again, you can take those and you can cut full heads of salanova, stick them in bins, store them four to six weeks if they're properly you know, managed. But then we would go into, for our January and February, we'd go into direct seeded. And so we'd direct seed the lettuce in beds pretty tight. And that just seems to grow the best. The thing with lettuce is if you get the core size of the, the plant large, too large, the cold really attacks that and really blows those cells apart. But if you keep this baby leaf, the core size of that, the base of that plant is so small that it won't affect it as much. Um, Asian greens, we talked about that, interplanting that, and we just pick a couple different varieties and interplant that with the chard. This may not be a, a sell, sale item with your markets. It, it, was, it was limited for us, and we really tried hard to push it to people. And so we would do demos and that sort of thing, and it really was able to increase the sales of that. But that is something that you want to think about if that's going to work for you. All right, um, you can see here harvesting that. I also love the purple. And we would always grow a little bit of purple. So we would put one purple leaf in every bunch because it pushes sales up. Um, the other thing you can grow in the winter, and we have, is the, sprout, is the broccoli, the mini broccoli, like Happy Rich. Now, we found that it just wasn't in the fall. You could get one harvest, and then pretty much it stopped growing. But what you can do here is it's best planted in February in the greenhouse, and it'll start being ready in, let's say, end of March, early April. Um, again, a few more slides on microgreens, and then we'll take questions. So um, 
yeah, I'll just talk about microgreens. I only have one slide. So we had a heated bench greenhouse. And so what we would do is basically in that greenhouse, you're using two thirds less fuel. So instead of trying to heat the entire greenhouse to let's say 70 degrees, you have insulation, you have your heating cables, and then you have your trays of microgreens on top of that. And so then over the top of that, we put a couple layers of row cover and that kept the whole thing really nice and warm. And so that really we decreased the amount of energy we're using and also allowed us to produce a really nice premium product all winter long. So again, let's talk a little bit about numbers in the greenhouse here. Um, so what we would really look at for ours is that we were looking at dollars per square foot week. And that's actually another 45 minute talk. But here's the one slide version, is that every single crop you take, and you take the weeks that's in the greenhouse, the weeks that's in the field, and you multiply that by the yield per square foot and what you're making per square foot off of that. And that kind of gives you a magic number of how much per week that's making you. And so different crops make different amount of money, like things like ginger. It's a long season crop, but your price is so high on that, at least ours was, that we were actually able to actually make really good money on that. Um, things like you know greenhouse tomatoes also make really good money. These, the winter greens, start to move down into here because obviously in the winter is growing slower. But there's still, like lettuce mix again was one of our top winter greens. Spinach, um, the spinach right here, this one, this year, that year was a very poor spinach year, so that really should have been a lot higher because um, it does definitely make a lot more money on that. But um, so that yield was, was relatively low. But again, looking at your crops on a per week basis compared to a, a long se full season basis really allows you to dial in which crops you're actually making money on. Um, packing and storage, so a few slides on this. So moving product in the wintertime can be a challenge because vegetables freeze. And we were fortunately only an hour, hour and a half from our markets. So we were able to load the truck, drive like crazy, and usually unload before stuff would freeze. One of the things we did run is anything that would sit on the bottom of the truck would freeze more, more qu quickly than crops that were higher up. So what we would do is put our root crops on the bottom because they just tend to freeze slower or you could just run a two inch piece of insulation there like blue board or something at the bottom as well. Um, I have seen people heat trucks. I do not recommend taking like a portable propane heater and just sticking it back there. That's a recipe for disaster. Um, but they do make truck heaters if you're really far north and need to do that or just an insulated um, box truck would work out real well. And then for us, you know, we did winter growing of greens mainly because we were trying to sell root crops. So for us, we had these two 40-foot storage containers where we would put 40-some tons of roots. So potatoes, turnips, radishes, I mean, winter radishes, carrots, beets, um, parsnips, that sort of thing. We'd even store things like Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and winter squash, sweet potatoes. And so that, the greens drew the customers, which then they went and bought all the root crops, which is where we really made our money in the wintertime because the cost of production on those root crops and what we could get for them in the wintertime was dramatically higher than the greens, which are profitable, but still there's only a limited amount you can pull out per square foot without heating a tunnel. Um, so this is what it looks like inside of, those, um, of those, those, those containers. And we were not at a scale where we were at bulk containers. So we'd love to have been at a scale where we were just pulling out you know, 1,000 pounds or carrots at a time or 800 pounds. And instead we were at this 45 pound bag which, um, and it, it was an inefficient use of this because you had to keep an aisle way to, to move this all out of here. But again, it worked for us. Um, we had a lot of great um, crops in there and that really made us, I mean, we were an average winter market for us was like uh, 1000 to $2,500. All right, a couple Facebook groups again. This is our one that we really focus on the, the four season. There's a bunch of them which definitely jump on. Um, great, great information there. And if you want the slides from this talk, Again, go to Messenger, click the People button at the bottom, click the Scan Code, and there's your code. All right, I'll take some questions. Question in the front, yes. Is there a way we can access the longer form talk? Um, repeat the question. So yeah, the question is, can we access the longer form talk? It's not recorded, unfortunately. So I really do need to turn that into probably a mini course or something, um, and I just haven't done that. But yeah, there are, if you go on our SlideShare, I think I think type Michael Kilpatrick and SlideShare, a lot of those talks are on there. Um, yeah, I think there's on there, so I think that that's the best way to find that information. Uh, another question over, yes, over here. 
Yep. Yeah, so the question is, storing greens, how tightly can you pack them? That's a great question. So we got to the point where we were taking the, the big macro bins. We had a golf cart that had a bed that tilted. And so we would actually take the macro bin, stick it in that bed, tilt it up at a 45 degree angle. We had a crew going through the field cutting heads of lettuce. Then we had a crew going behind them and stuffing those heads of lettuce in that macro bin and just filling that entire thing. Then the tractor would come up, pick the bin up, put it in the, we had an insulated truck body that we would store those in. So we were really packing it in there. I mean, you don't need to be loose. The biggest thing is you do not want wet greens. They want to be completely dry. If there's snow on them, that actually can be OK. You just want to make sure you keep the temperature at around 32 degrees. Um, because a lot of those greens will actually take a couple degrees of, of freezing without any damage. And so we actually had our truck body get to 30 degrees one night, and everything was frozen in there. But because we, we were very, very slowly brought that temperature back up, we had very, very minimal damage. Not that I'm saying I want you to freeze all these greens because it can destroy them, <laughs> but trying to keep right at that 33 degrees is where you're going to really get that really good length on, on storage. Yes? Yes. Yeah, so the question is on the insulated storage containers. Let's go back there. They were, they're overseas shipping containers that are insulated. So they're used to bring like corn from China because we're all eating awesome, wonderful things coming from China these days. Um, and what happens is it's a one way shipment because so much is coming from other places into the US that they're relatively inexpensive. And so we would buy these things. You can get a high cube for about five to 7,000. Um, the lower cubes are a little bit cheaper. And what a high cube is is another foot and a half tall. And those are just nice. It gives you more space in there to work. But um, if you type in, go to the places that sell like the uninsulated ones, um, those are like two or three grand. But these, the insulated ones, as you can see in this picture, they've got stainless steel walls. They've got a slotted um, aluminum floor. They're just already food safe inside. We did replace the, the cooling systems. And so for our big one, we just went ahead and put, I think, a three horsepower cooling unit in it. And you could dump in there two tons, three tons of roots a day, and it would just bring them down really quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, we made a lot of money off roots. And those, those storage containers were paid for themselves within a year because you can, put a, you can put tens of thousands of pounds per container. And each of those, you know, you're getting a dollar to two dollars to three dollars per pound. That adds up very quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, those containers, again, if you've got a cooler, you can do the exact same thing with a cooler. This just worked for us because we were trying to build our farm as a very mobile farm, and these are very easy to move. Another question. Yes? Uh, your table, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is on our heated tables for microgreens, how did that work? So what we would do there is it was, um, it's, uh, if you go to like Biotherm or if you go to like um, Delta T, they sell that's a little like a spaghetti tube with water through it. So we put down the um, blue board, so inch, inch blue board underneath that, the cables, and then we would just take landscape fabric and landscape fabric over the top, so no sand. But we were running those tubes every, I think every two inches is where they put them. Now I know some people that don't do blue board and just put them on top of like a, a expanded metal table, and they're going because they're more worried about um, airflow. And so they're actually giving up about probably 30% of the efficiency because they're really more concerned about the airflow. We were worried about airflow because you get disease in that, but we were using a lot of, um, uh, what's the product? It's a, it's a powder you can put on it. Gosh, it's in my microgreens talk, but um, it's basically a root shield. We put on root shield, and root shield just does an incredible job of getting rid of any of that damping off or disease in the middle of the winter. Because um, we almost stopped growing microgreens because of that issue until we found root shield and added that to our, our soil mix. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is on kale going past like January in the tunnels. So the biggest thing is, again, hardening it off properly. So keeping the house open, letting it grow slower. So or starting earlier. 
So that was the biggest thing for us. But again, you're in the Midwest. I don't know. Maybe you get less light because I know of some growers which do have more challenges than we did with that. Um, kale is it's not one of the easiest ones to go in through winter with. And we only went with large form kale too because baby kale in the middle of the winter in a greenhouse, there's no yield on that. Yes, it was full size. Yeah, it would, and granted, if it got too big, it would just go down. So you kind of want to keep those plants a little bit on the smaller size going into the winter and, and, and know that you're going to make your money March, April, and May because it just, it's pumping out a bunch of wheat. And then it goes, starts to flower, and then you snap the flower stalks, and oh my gosh, that's, that's where it's at. Yes, that's where it's at. Uh, another question. Yes. Yeah, so the question is on the, uh, the containers um, storing the vegetables. Did we have to put heat in there in the middle of the winter? So vegetables give off heat as they're just, they, they're alive. Um, not that they eat you or anything, but <laughs> they are giving off that heat during the winter time. And so we found with the fans from the um, uh, blowers for the cooling system, that was putting enough heat in there with that. But I think one, when we got to like minus 20 or minus 25, we would throw a little 1500 watt space heater in there and that would just take care of it. And that was just on a little thermostat in there to keep it at you know, 36 degrees or so. Yes? Yeah, so the question is on this slide where it's got the, um, basically I think it's a construction light string. Um, we just put that in there for lights. I mean, we wouldn't, just for lights. Yeah, they do though, you're correct. Um, now the other reason to put lights in your cooler is if you're trying to store things like Brussels sprouts, um, long-term storage, is they will turn white in storage because they don't have any light. And again, they're still alive. So if you do store Brussels sprouts for any long beyond two or three weeks, before you, before you from the market, put a light on them for a day or two, and then that will green them back up. So that is, that is one reason you do want to have light in your cooler. Yes, another question. Yep. Yes, so the question is on the kale we've cut into the boxes. Usually, I really like growing um, starboard. Is that the small one? I like growing starboard because I could cut the entire plant and stuff that in, and then you could actually make that a bunch. But what usually happened is we would just go through our care field and harvest all fall, and then we would have the rosettes at the top, and we'd just go through and just hack all the rosettes, and they would get dumped into a bulk bin, and then those would just get stuffed <laughs> in bags. Or you take three or four rows and just make a bunch. So yeah, I mean, it's, kale is just one of those crops which uh, the market seems to really go for, and it's relatively easy to grow. So. Yes. Yes, you do not want. Yes. So the question is on the greens that we would cut and store. You no wash at all. You want to be put in there dirty, and get down that get that temperature down really quick. Keep your humidity up at 100%, um, but do not get it wet because that'll just slime and, and go nasty on you. And we were managing that too. So it depends on the year. Sometimes we store really well. If it wasn't, then we would just go in early and we would just clear it out and send it to a wholesaler. So, all right. Any other questions here before we go to lunch? Plenty of time. Plenty of time. Do I have any more slides? No, I think I'm out of slides. I'll put up the um, that if you want to grab. the make sure grab the slides. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So the question is pest problems in February. And so what happens is as you're planting winter greens, because this is a completely unnatural situation you're doing, is you have to front load the fertility to get the crops to grow in the fall. And you also, as it gets colder, your um, utilization of those greens just goes down because the soil activity drops. And so you basically, there's nothing happening in the middle of the winter. But what happens in February is your soil temperature comes back up your soil becomes active and alive. All of a sudden now there's so much nitrogen and your crop starts to take off and starts to grow like crazy. And the aphids come in because now it's a very easy, very, um, just they can get plenty of food and the cell walls are very soft because of that excess nitrogen. 
So what happens at that point is you have to do one of two things. One thing we start doing regularly in February, we start irrigating regularly, and that starts to flush down the nitrogen into the soil profile. So that keeps them going a little bit slower. The other thing we do is we just scout weekly, and as soon as we see any aphids, we're just buying in ladybugs and the other predators as well. Um, we actually, this year in our little home greenhouse, and, and probably half the reason is because I'm rarely home and I don't manage very well, um, is we had aphids actually in November move in, which I'd never seen before. And I think part of it was because my soil management is not like I want it to be because we're still new, it's new, so new soil for us. Um, so we brought in, we did um, safer soap, which is really good on aphids, but we also tried to bring in ladybugs because I was like, well, it's my test plot. I don't need to eat off this. We have a CSA share with another farm anyway, so I can just throw some ladybugs in there and see what happens. Didn't do anything. They were too cold and they were just trying to survive and they really did not eat the aphids. So um, if you do get them, I mean, that safer soap really does very effective and mix that with some organic really can really help get rid of those. All right. Yes? Yes, yes. So again, we didn't really have a few slides for that. And I've got a, I don't know how many gigabytes, repeat the question. So the question is on the knee walls. Um, I've got, I think it's a, a lot of gigabytes. And it's over 200 videos of a greenhouse build we did this fall. So we're going to be putting that together and it'll be online at some point. Um, but, um, and so that shows exactly how we put that together. But basically a knee wall is put there to keep the, <laughs> the uh, rabbits out, it keeps the, you know, voles and that sort of thing, especially if you go down into the soil with it. Um, but it's basically to also keep the cold air from going right across the plants. Um, so what you have the knee wall, with drop down side, that knee wall starts up really high, so when you're just cracking it for ventilation, you only got, you know, it's four feet up. That's ideal. But drop down signs are notoriously leaky. There's a couple other reasons not to do them. So if you do the roll up sides, you start that roll up side about two feet high. Your knee wall goes below that. Normally, we're running for the top of that. For the harnois, they just run a wire. And every bow, it's attached with a little tiny clip. And so it just holds that wire. And then you've got plastic, which goes up one side and then over the top and back down the other. And so then that's just fastened at the bottom. So that's how they, the easiest, cheapest way to do it. But that's not really long term, because I think you just have to replace that. So what we've seen people do is just run a channel at the top, like a two by two box tube. And then from there, they just run um, polycarbonate down, or you could run, what we did is we took the, the woven poly and then just sort of ran a wiggle wire along there and ran a woven poly down. So yeah, there's a couple of different ways you can do that, and uh, again, use steel and don't, so you don't have to replace it. And yes? Oh yes, the, uh, the Facebook groups. Um, oops, there we are. Right there. So yeah, there's a number of them, and I really need to put a page on our website that kind of has all the online ones because there's like another four or five that have popped up. Um, we run a beginning four season farming one now. We have, we're about, there's a Planet Junior one, which I didn't mention. We're about to start a paper pot one just because there's so much interest in that right now. Um, so yeah, um, but yeah, definitely click over there. And once you get into one, they usually link to each other, and that people in there will tell you which ones are the best. And what's the name of the Facebook group? Um, the, the name? If you just go into Facebook and type in these names right here, the group will pop up. Yeah. I really should create a. a yes? Yeah, so the question is the farmer's friend caterpillar tunnels and the snow load. Um, again, it all depends on how far apart you put those bows. I don't like them in the fact that it's a three-piece bow. It's inherently weaker, but it's the way you can ship them. And the price is un it's ridiculously good. Um, and he's done a lot of, yeah, it's a really great product. But for winter production, I think you want to push those bows a little closer or just be out there. What you can do is put a, every third bow, put a two by four down the center. And if we do a four bed system, a 36 inch bed, a 30 inch, 30 inch, and a 36, and then right down that center aisle, you could put those posts. Um, but you can also bend your own bows. And what you can do is you can go to like, we have fence companies, and usually fence companies get their fence material from Allied Steel because they're the ones that have the triple layer, the gator shield covering. And you can get the inch and a third top rail 
and 24 foot lengths is what you want. Sometimes they have to special order it, so you have to be ordering enough to make it worth their while. But um, yeah, there's Allied Steel distributors over the entire U.S. And you can just go right to them as well, too, is to the main company and uh, find out your distributor or just get direct from them depending on the amount of steel you're ordering. So, yes? Yeah. Yeah, great point. Yeah, great point is that out here on the Midwest, you guys have a ton of wind, and that those caterpillar tunnels, because they're not holding that plastic down with anything but tension. And so the, what happens is, a, 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 the, and they don't have a really good hold down system either. They're just using like a 24 inch uh, re rod. So what I've been telling Jonathan is he needs to have every third bow needs to have a, a clip that basically goes over the re-rod and then it has like a 45 degree angle and then you put another re-rod at a 45 degree angle. So that would keep that in much better. The other thing to do is just, if you know wind events coming, make sure you go out and tighten your ropes. And another thing you can do is the last couple uh, back and forths, replace it with a really heavy duty um, bungee. And that way, it's, it, you, you tricks that bungee out, and so even if it's really windy and it's rubbing and like that, it's still constantly keeping tension on that rope. So there's, yeah, there's a number of things you can do, but that is a really, really good. On our farm, we had horrible wind issues. With the top of the hill, the wind came right down the valley and just plowed into our tunnels and spent many sleepless nights. <laughs> so, all right, one more before we wrap up. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. That I wouldn't recommend that into the soil because the voles will actually eat through the. It's a woven poly fabric. Um, they'll eat through that actually, and rats would especially. But we find that they usually don't go above the soil line with that. So that's why we're starting to use flashing below. You can use aluminum flashing below, and it's cheap. It's a couple hundred bucks a tunnel, and it'll save you hours of chasing voles. What we normally do when we're dealing in a house is we dig a trench on either side. We dig a trench a foot down, and that's where we put our drainage right in there again. So then we put our we put our insulation down in there, and then we just right in front of the insulation we put that that down there. And so that what makes it super easy because it's opened up. Then we just go ahead and backfill, um, and that means also you're driving your post a foot less. So if you have rocks, having that one foot trench means a lot less rocks to drive through. So. All right, I think we're good.